And I told you that there's, you know, I like, I mean, I like legged robots for many reasons. They're cool. But um, they also, I think, are a nice introduction to some of the concepts of contact mechanics and, and some of the other things that will take our initial tools to the next level. So I want to do that today. I want to, I want to think about what does it mean to do trajectory optimization through contact. And there's a couple different pieces of that story. But the first version we'll get through nicely today. And I think it will give you some important uh, ways to think about systems that make and break contact. And actually, many systems can be, done, can be treated with hybrid trajectory optimization. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's put that in context here. So last time, we kind of brought up two important ideas, right? We went, the first one was limit cycle stability. which isn't needed for every contact problem, but it's pretty useful for walking robots. And, you know, that was, you know, we started off before with notions of trajectory stability, which was saying that somehow x of t minus x nominal of t, we want that to go to zero, right, as time goes to infinity. So orbital stability. Which was saying now I'm going to allow myself to find the closest time on the, on the nominal trajectory. I'll allow myself to search over that, and I just ask that distance to go to zero. This is tr a useful concept. This notion of orbital stability can be a useful concept for non-periodic trajectories. Um, <clears throat> but it's sort of absolutely essential for limit cycle stability, because limit cycles have the property that they don't converge in time. They, will, you know, they don't converge in phase. Right? So, we needed this extra machinery of orbital stability to think about the stability of a cycle. And the second thing we introduced was hybrid dynamics. And I did it with, um, with just the rimless wheel, very simple example, right? So we said, I have some robot on the slope, my rimless wheel on the slope. Okay, and we modeled this as actually a continuous dynamics which was just in the limited case of the rimless wheel is actually just the inverted pendulum. plus an instantaneous impact. We call it an event that happens when the foot comes around and hits the ground, where we modeled the dynamics of that impulsive inelastic collision, which gave us, which turned out in the rimless wheel to be particularly simple. We just said that the velocity after the impact, so velocity plus this plus superscript was my just after the event, just turned out to be cosine minus two alpha velocity minus where this was two alpha was my inner leg angle. But also the other thing that happened in, in addition to losing some angular velocity is we changed coordinate systems and we put the pin joint now on this new stance foot. And now we have a pendulum around a different point. So I think that's a really good example, that, you know, where we could, like I said, it was the last time, last walking system I'll completely understand. Uh, like any initial conditions, I could tell you where it's going to go. 
you know, you can tell me any initial conditions anywhere in uh, the state space, and I can tell you what the final solution is going to be. Uh, you can't do that for most walking robots. Um, okay, but I think it's going to now we're going to try to transition from that simple idea of hybrid dynamics and orbital stability and the like into a more the more general notion of walking, making contact, um, and things like that. Right. And to be clear, it's, it's hybrid because it's both continuous and it has this event, which is kind of a discrete uh, thing that happens. And today I want to start, you know, we, last time we just did a graphical analysis of the Poincaré map, or we did, we made some plots. Okay, but today we're going to start using optimization to do the same thing. And again, I'll do it in two parts. I think there's a couple very simple things to say about optimization for limit cycles, and then we'll bring in the hybrid dynamics part of it. The limit cycles are almost, it's almost not much to say at all, but um, how do you find a limit cycle is, is a good question. How do you parameterize it? So a starting question, you know, sub question which we, I never said explicitly, but it was kind of in the air before, was how do you find a fixed point? All right, so if you have a differential equation like this, how do you find a fixed point of that? Well, that just turns out to be something we can do very nicely with our standard optimization tools. So the fixed points of that are finding an x where f of x equals 0, right? So I can write an optimization problem. Well, let's just ins find me an x subject to f of x equals 0. For most f's, that's a nonlinear, non-convex optimization. So maybe we'll throw snop at that. But we can certainly look for x's. The, we've also said a few times that I would typically try to put some objective on there. Maybe find me a small x or something like that. But if you wanted to find, for instance, when Atlas was balancing on its toe, right, and I wanted to do LQR around a fixed point, the first step of that process was actually to just analyze the Atlas's equation and find some fixed point. I had to find, you know, more generally, if I had x dot in u, I could, I could say that I want to find me a pair of x u, so that equals 0. I had to find some set of torques and initial conditions that were somewhere where I wanted the robot to be that set that to equal to 0. I linearized around that. I did LQR to balance. For a quad rotor, right, I, if you set u to 0 on a quad rotor, that's not a fixed point. That's falling out of the sky. I mean, it turns out the fixed point for that is pretty easy. You just take gravity and divide it by four and spread it across your propellers. But, but you could have solved for that with an optimization. And I think there's a lot of cases where you must solve. You know, there's, if you now have a slung load, a few of you are thinking about slung load uh, quadrators. I mean, maybe you, you must solve for something like that um, with an optimization. OK, so. Um, for the limit cycles, our, the, uh, the obvious analogy to this is to use our tools from trajectory optimization to find the nominal cycle. And even for the, um, you know, the systems that we've, we've written down, the Vanderpoel is about as simple as it gets. But it, it's, I don't know how to write a closed form expression for the, the curve that is the stable limit cycle of the Vanderpoel oscillator. Every time I've shown that to you, I actually found that by solving a small optimization or simulating long enough till it came to a basically periodic solution. For, for the Vanderpool oscillator, that works. You can just to remind you here, right, our Vanderpool oscillator, this one I could actually just pick any initial condition. Zero would be the only bad choice, okay? But if I picked any other initial condition and I simulate it long enough, then at some point I can just take I can, I still have to do some, a little bit of algorithmic work to find a periodic version of that, right? I'll just get a very long trajectory and at some point I have to figure out 
the duration of that trajectory and, and clamp that down. I could find that for the, for the limit cycle, but a more general way to do that would be to say, find me some trajectory x. Probably you want to search over the duration t subject to x dot equals f of x. And let's say f0 equals x of t. And when I write, you know, subject to x dot equals f of x, this would be implemented by the transcription or the shooting or the co-location methods, right? We talked about different ways to turn that general concept into a set of specific constraints that you transcribe into the mathematical program. Okay? And so that works, and that works, I mean, it's just, it was, I, I was trying to make a nice visualization of it sort of converging on the limit cycle, and it, it was, I threw it all away because it just converges in two cycles and it's, there's nothing to see. So I, I tried to make uh, the best, like, slightly interesting case, um, right? That this is just the limit cycle of the Vanderpool oscillator achieved by writing a trivial optimization, start a direct collocation, I make the time intervals roughly equally spaced, I say the initial constraint has to, I chose the initial constraint to be on the vertical, but that's fine, and I just basically say the final state equals the initial state solved with one extra detail, right? So the default guess, if you just ask SNOP to solve, it's actually zero almost always for these solvers. So if you, if you don't do anything, it'll just find the trivial solution at, at the origin. So the, what you see in this figure, I just, I just started it with like something that was clockwise. I mean, I spent zero time making that. I just, I just said, you know, sine, cos, you know, just kind of walked around in a circle so I'd use that as your initial condition, and then from there it just went straight to the limit cycle. Yeah? So in, in all of the, I guess, the optimization schemes, there is a small amount of numerical error that builds up to sort of clocking in these ends. Yep. Does that ever build up by the time you reach the end of the limit cycle? So like, we're like, it looks like in our approximation we're going into the limit cycle, but we really don't. So that is absolutely correct. So the question was about, um, you know, numerical artifacts, and are we kidding ourselves that we didn't actually, might not have actually gotten around the cycle perfectly? Um, but I think, so if you, so the way that you said it implied strong causality from the beginning towards the end. The solver is actually solving it all jointly. So I think in practice, the numerics are that you have an approximation that's roughly accurate around the cycle, but it will certainly be an approximation. The true cycle will be probably nearby along the entire cycle and it'll be you know, accurate up to that integration accuracy. It is a true cycle for the approximate dynamics that we get from direct collocation or whatever. Yep, and I think it, it doesn't, it has never, we could probably analyze it carefully, but it's never felt fragile in that way. It's actually very similar to like hitting zero at the, you know, for the minimum time problem. It's, it has the same kind of accumulation of errors. Good question. Okay, so that, that idea sort of makes sense, right? I mean, just, just one extra constraint. Just say that the, the and it's a you know, relative constraint, that the end condition equals the beginning condition. It's even a linear constraint. Nice constraint. That's actually enough, almost, to do walking robot, right? It's, it's almost, it's just a one little bit more, right? So now if you wanted to do hybrid limit cycles, do it over here. Let's do the rimless wheel specifically first because that's easy to, to think about. Find me an x t, okay, subject to the pendulum dynamics in the cycle. Okay, and I would like to say that, um, so x in the rimless wheel is just theta and theta dot. I'll say that I'd like theta at time zero 
to be in my sort of one, one foot is back on the ramp. You remember the, the geometry of that? The gamma minus alpha was like the condition where I'm touching the ramp on this side. Gamma plus alpha was the condition on that side. Okay, theta um, at my capital T should be gamma plus alpha. So I might find the cycle that goes from here, you know, around to here. It's, I don't have enough legs to do that properly, but I hope you know what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And, uh, and then the only extra thing I need to do is take that remapping of variables into account and that loss of energy. So I'm going to just say that I know that my periodicity, periodicity constraint is almost the same as before, but I've lost cosine 2 alpha at that impact. Right? And that's enough. So I can write direct collocation. The initial state is um, slope minus alpha. Oh, I put, I said that, sorry, that one's saying that they're all between the two. Um, the initial state is slope minus, minus alpha. The final state is slope plus alpha. And then I just say the initial state is the final state minus or times cosine of two. That's it. That's the whole pro pro problem. Oops. And it solves, and I plot, and I get the blue curve here, which is exactly the stable walking limit cycle of the rimless wheel. Okay. That's cool. We can we can solve for you know stable solutions of our passive walking robots uh, just with that basic tool. And in fact, this has been a tool for science, right? So people have studied um, mechanics, you know, biomechanics of walking, and they've started using, not too many years ago, they started using uh, trajectory optimization tools to try to make scientific statements about how people walk and, and, and things like this. So actually, I brought a book. There's this great, great book, highly recommended by some Harvard, by a Harvard guy, McNeil Alexander, Optima for Animals, right? He's got many books, actually, but this book is awesome, especially if you like animals and optimization, both. Um, I should even just, I should just show you the table of contents here. It's like optimum structures, tubular bones, strengths of bones, compound eyes, eggshells. Every one of them, he talks about how like the shape of an egg is actually optimal under some stress strain characteristics, right? Optimum movements is the next part, bounding flight, high jumping, walking and running, right? Optimum behavior, how do you choose words, food for a moose? I don't remember that one, but you know, optimum lifestyles, stuff like this. It's an awesome book. He's like, every, every single one of them, there's a very basic argument where he says, maybe animals are choosing, are operating the way they're operating. Even our bones are reshaping the way they're reshaping because they're solving some optimization problem. And his, the story there, I went and did a little bit out of order. This is the book here, okay. Um, one of the things he talked about in the walking chapter is that uh, he did a series of experiments where, uh, where you have people walking on a treadmill, you measure their volume of oxygen consumed or CO2 consumed, and, and you can estimate their metabolic cost, their energy consumed. It's not the only way to measure energy consumed, but that's a pretty good one. And what you do is you put them on a treadmill and you tell them to walk or you tell them to run, and then you change the speed of the treadmill, okay? And people like, uh, you know, people are particularly efficient at some speeds and other speeds. So this is a, a plot of the speed of the treadmill, okay? And this is the metabolic cost of walking at different speeds. It's hard to run at very low speeds, of course. It's hard to walk at very fast speeds. But there's places where you can do both, okay? And then if you, if you do a separate set of experiments and you just say, I'm going to set the treadmill, walk or run, do whatever you want. You pick, right? Guess what? Guess, which, guess what their natural preferred transition speed from walking to running is, right? It's right in that intersection. It's 2.2. It's kind of a famous number. 
uh, in walking robots or walking stuff. 2.2 meters per second is when people tend to prefer to transition. This is, you know, um, there's different different things you can ask people to do. You can ask them, you can try to change their stride frequency given, you know, fixing different other, other variables and they tend to prefer, you can see the little arrow here, their preferred stride frequency is, is right down in the minimum. There's actually, um, you know, this is an old result, the, the level at which we understand that kind of a claim has matured dramatically. People are able to do uh, really uh, much stronger measurements of energy consumed, and it's a much more subtle argument than just, you know, walking and running. Uh, I, I could tell you, I could give references if people, people want. Max Donilon has done some incredible work on that, for instance. <coughs> but it's a really compelling story, I think, of sort of maybe animals, you could describe animals' behavior. A guiding principle might be optimization. Okay, so, um, so how do people start using this? So, so this is the need walker I talked about before. I showed you that simulation, but what I maybe said or didn't say, but it's very hard. You know, the, the, the Vanderpool oscillator I could have just found by simulating forward, but this one, if you just simulate forward from a random initial condition, it falls down. And you actually have to do optimization to find this limit cycle. And people have done this sort of like study of walking and running using the simple models like the, the, the compass gate, even the simple compass gate. Um, there's a class of models that Manoj and Andy studied uh, using uh, actuators in the legs, telescoping actuators in the legs. There's similar models that have springs in the legs, okay? And they studied the, the natural energetic cost of walking and running and tried to make predictions about when people would walk at different, you know, different regimes where people would walk and why. And they matched McMahon's uh, studies in a nice way. It also led to this sort of nice class of models, which are a little bit more, um, I put this in because one of you is doing, uh, you know, spring knee walking for your projects too, but you can take a compass gate, add a spring into the leg, and this model actually has limit cycles that walk and limit cycles that run, hopping like a pogo stick a little bit, okay? And the transition that might go between them can be understood using optimization as a tool, changing some parameters of speed or other uh, parameters and finding the natural transitions be between walking and running. Okay, and they, they came out with curves that look surprisingly similar to McMahon's curves even though I look, don't look exactly like a pogo stick robot. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's like the nominal uh, human. Yeah, um, but but it's it's a pretty robust number, I think. Yeah. Uh, typically, uh, all, all the real quantities are dimensionless quantities that are normalized for leg length, or um, uh, they they try to be unitless. So Froude number, and uh, you guys might might think about these things in on flapping too, right? There's, there's some basic dimensionless quantities that are more consistent. Yeah? Just a little bit of a nebulous question, but um, is there a way to analyze the periodicity of these limit cycles in like the dot domain um, to like explain what the state of the domain is? Good question. So, okay, so, um, so there's a, uh, so a natural sort of connection that might fire in your brain is that we were talking about periodic um, trajectories. We could take a Fourier series, Fourier transform, you know, talk about the uh, Fourier series for periodic, right? And so, so yes, a natural parameterization of trajectories that are periodic, you could use a, a frequency domain representation, and that would be a nice way to parameterize a trajectory optimization, for instance, uh, for purely periodic trajectories. And I think the, the, the frequency domain structure gives us particularly good ways to talk about periodicity constraints and stuff like that. It's not as common, you know, I think we have good toolboxes in time domain and they work in the nonlinear setting. Um, there's a class of techniques called pseudo-spectral methods that do, um, do something a little bit more like that. that are, that's a, you know, a, a famous class of, of trajectory optimization methods. Definitely those connections exist. There's actually, you know, if I had time in the semester, I would tell, tell you a lot more about 
running. It's really fun. There's like a lot of good examples. I have examples of like exploding cockroaches and uh, it turns out, um, you know, so, so here's a fun, a little fun one, right? So um, do elephants ever run? People are like, no way, you know, some people are kind of maybe. Like they can move pretty fast, right? You don't want to like piss off an elephant. Um, they can move pretty fast. Uh, so someone studied that finally. They like put mocap on an elephant, right? Outdoor mocap on big elephants running around at 15 meters per second or something like this. And the answer was really interesting, right? So it, it, the answer is it depends how you define running, right? If you say your legs have to be in the air, like all four legs have to be in the air, the answer is no, they don't run. But the biomechanicists actually say that the real definition of running is what your center of mass is doing, okay? If your center of mass, so for walking is more like vaulting, where you go over your stance leg, okay? And running is more like a spring, that's what these spring models, where you go down and you recover energy. Okay, so the, by that definition, elephants do run. But it's even more subtle. They said if you look at the kinematics of the front legs versus the back legs, you could kind of say the front legs are, I forget which one, I think the front legs are walking and the back legs are running. I think that was like their conclusion on their two-page two nature paper. But um, there's like so many cool things about animals and locomotion. But I digress. So uh, <laughs> let's think of, I could leave it right here. So the, uh, <coughs> the generalization of this, and maybe the most important thing that I want you to get today is this more general picture of hybrid hybrid dynamics and certainly hybrid trajectory optimization. It's a picture I find myself going back to a lot when I'm thinking about these things. Um, I'll do it instead of saying a autonomous hybrid system is a tuple with whatever, I will just draw some pictures. But Generally speaking, a good way to think about all these systems that make and break contact is to think about I have a system that is evolving with some continuous dy dynamics. Okay, and then something happens, a discrete event, my foot hit the ground or something like this, okay. And I need to describe the transition, or the, the dynamics of that event, what happens to my state over that event, which we'll do with a common language, okay? And then afterwards, I'm evolving continuously again. Okay, so we can have different, the, this part here, these continuous parts are typically called the modes of the hybrid system. This here is called the guard, or sometimes um, a witness function, you might, you might use a witness function to define the guard. And we typically write this in an autonomous hybrid system as being defined by some function of the state, okay? When, when I have a zero crossing of some function of the state, then that's what triggers my event. And the way my simulators, uh, someone asked before about how I simulated carefully the, the return map, right? I, we tend to tell our simulators about these functions that change smoothly, but the event happens when you cross zero. So you watch, you integrate, you integrate, and if you go past, because your phi became negative, it will go back and find exactly the, cro the zero crossing, okay? And then this dynamics in between here is called the reset map. Which is a discrete dynamics to say something like x2 is some delta of x1 right before the collision. So 
So for contact, like I said, this is actually an approximation. The real model, we should think of as being a very stiff spring, for instance, interacting with the ground and dissipating energy very quickly. And there's a, there is a, actually a continuous but very stiff um, system that would describe that evolution. But it can be, I think, more efficient, more and certainly numerically better to summarize that as a discrete event, right? That I just instantaneously lost energy with an impulse, okay? This picture is like really general, really powerful, right? The guard is a geometric quantity in the walking case, right? This is actually the kinematics of my foot relative to the ground, right? So when like my foot position passes to the ground, I could just take the distance, if I took this to be the distance between the foot and the ground, or the distance between any two rigid objects, right? I can write that as a, as a event. And it might be a curvy, complicated thing, and there might be more of them that I might hit in more complicated settings. But always I define my dynamics as when I have this event, I take a discrete jump, and I continue on, okay? This is the language of hybrid systems, the way we use them in class, okay? It's called autonomous hybrid systems because uh, in this, this particular version of it is called autonomous because the events happen based on the dynamics. You're not in control of when the events happen. There are other hybrid systems like uh, models of uh, transmissions in a car where the control system gets to decide the transition. That would not be autonomous, right? The autonomous is saying that it evolves by itself, yeah? Good. So I, I was careful to not write you across here because that would imply you have the ability to make an instantaneous, like, impulsive control input. Some people, th there's examples where you kind of cheat with that, but no physical actuator can make an impulsive, uh, you know, do work in instantaneously. So we tend to, to write it like this first. Like the, the example of pushing off with the toe at, you know, it, it, you could try to summarize some like, imp you know, uh, bursty actuator with that kind of a model, but I wrote it without it. Good observation. So for instance, I mean, this is really the language um, that, that you'll use in optimization. You'll even use, um, you know, in simulation. So I, I wrote a quick simulation of that spring-loaded inverted pendulum, which is the simplest running system. It's kind of the rimless wheel of, of running. Okay, uh, just to show you what it looks like here. Right, I, high quality animation or graphics here, right? That's a periodic solution, a stable periodic solution of the dynamical system. The, um, this is perfectly elastic instead of inelastic because it has a massless toe and it has a spring in the leg. Okay, but that's the basic model. But what, and I, there's details about that in the notes, but I didn't, I chose not to talk about that in detail, but what I do want to show you is the way you define that in code, sorry for the scrolling, it was up higher than I realized, okay. So you make your spring-loaded inverted pendulum, it's got a couple parameters, okay. You define the witness function as a touchdown event. You, uh, there's a takeoff event too, where it transitions dynamics again. I put an um, event at the apex because that's what I took the Poincaré section around for the analysis that I won't do, okay? But I tend to, I tend to analyze the apex to apex return map. And so I used a witness function again to tell me when that happens. And, <clears throat> you know, this touchdown and takeoff are just fairly simple um, functions of the foot height, right? Which is just a function that you implement just like the dynamics um, and and you can write these, these models out and have them simulate forward. A small thing to mention is that, um, you know, we showed you how to write very simple leaf systems where the, you know, the state is a vector and you just do math on the vector and put it out. As you and your projects start getting into more complicated systems, you're, you're not going to want to think about it as a vector of numbers. You're going to want names for the elements of it. And th there's lots of examples you'll see as the examples get more interesting, but, um, you can just make, in Python, we support this thing called a named view. I'm gonna you know, say these are the names of the states, and then you'll see how that works in, the, in all of the methods. You just quickly 
convert from the the state into this s, and then you can operate it out with with its names. That's just a little programming thing, but that helps a lot to write readable code and to debug things. Um, and it's just a view on the data, so it doesn't cost really anything, and you can write into it and send it back, and it's, it's a good thing. Okay, but what's important is you really just define the continuous time dynamics bef as before, but then you define these witness functions, and in those witness functions, you also defined the reset map. Unrestricted update was the takeoff event, or the takeoff reset, yeah. Um, that's a good question. So for the slip model, so you can you can choose different things. Ba the, the short answer is that for the slip model, it's sort of reasonable to linearize the um, the leg angle, and it, that linearization sort of ha causes uh, you know some errors which are most naturally corrected at the apex. Um, yeah. So so like the rimless wheel, we were able to write a one-dimensional return map and because we knew theta was the main variable. We chose the n minus one-dimensional map. In the slip model, um, since the energy is conserved, it happens that I can, if I'm in the apex, it's like a unique place where I can write the entire return map based on one variable again. Um, and it makes the linearization good. That was, that's a pretty system specific choice. But yeah. Um, I think you should where the reset map is not like one to one. You'd like it to always be a function this way. It certainly doesn't, I mean, it, the only requirement is that for you know, any x coming in, I can write an x2. There's no, um, uh, no further requirements. It doesn't have to be invertible or anything like that. In fact, it almost never is for an inelastic collisions. If I dropped something straight to the ground, I, you wouldn't be able to tell me beforehand the velocity with which it hit because all of the final conditions are gonna be stopped on the ground. So information is lost in addition to energy. Good, and you know, for a more interesting walking robot, sorry for the art skills or lack thereof, this is my robot's foot and I'm gonna put some sort of pointy things on there just so it has a, a few contacts. And I'll give it an ankle here and a leg here and then I'll stop the pain. Okay, but um, you could imagine having a discrete event when the heel comes down and another discrete event when the foot comes down, when the, the front forefoot comes down, and then a discrete event when the heel comes up, right? And actually the walking cycle, when people, people do this, they really will call out these you know, modes, like foot in the air, mode two would be heel on ground, three would be Heel plus toe on ground. Toe on ground. Okay, and then maybe you go back. You got two legs. You got more to do. You know, maybe you can say that you're never in double support. So you just go through a sequence where you're, you know, going like this. That would be that would make it easier. Less things to 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 list out. Um, Sliding friction is another set of options that you could you could be in a sliding regime or out of, you know, these the number of modes can grow very fast. Okay. So here's the um, you know, in addition to this picture, I think the biggest thing I want you to understand is that if you walk into a trajectory optimization problem and you know you're willing to prescribe the sequence of modes then, which is kind of what we got, we're able to do for the rimless wheel, then writing trajectory optimization is easy, okay? We write a trajectory optimization for this section, another set of parameters for this section, another set of parameters for this section, another set for this section, and we link the final condition of this with the initial condition of this. We say that the final condition of this is on the guard, and the initial condition is the reset of that variable on the guard. And I'm just putting costs and constraints across those those modes, right? The same way I did it in, the, in just the one mode returning on itself in that case, at the, I should say the last, you know, the final state of the foot in the air 
has to be such that the heel is on the ground. And the initial condition has to, of this one has to match the final state of this minus the return, the input. Okay, so this is just a sequence of these trajectory optimizations that we can put together. And we just solve them jointly. It's important to solve them jointly, right? Because you don't know where you need to connect, you know, where, where you need to land on the guard, for instance. Okay. But trajectory optimization, hybrid trajectory optimization, the thing that works very well enough to be a tool for science, um, is it works very well when you prescribe a mode sequence. If you don't prescribe a mode sequence, this is something I said to a few of you in your project feedback, then it gets a lot harder. We have, we have tools for that, okay, but they're, they're harder. They're, the, the numerics are more squirrely. You're more likely to get stuck in local minima Okay, you can try to solve jointly for the order in addition to the trajectories. But even parameterizing that takes a little bit more work. Sorry, Tony. Do you ever have to think about like ambiguity in which mode parameters you want to put in? So for example, with this, uh, with this foot on the ground, uh, when the maximum state is below the one you're given, which mode would you change it to? So you could have situations like this. Right, where there's neighboring trajectories that would transition through a different mode. I think that's maybe the, way, the right picture to have in your head. Um, people study simultaneous collision events. Just try to avoid it. Put a constraint there so you stop here, or a constraint there that stop there if you're gonna choose, choose the other one, right? But yeah, there is, there is work that people um, Try to try to study simultaneous events and stuff like this, and you have to be more careful with your work uh, on those kind of events. But that's the right picture, and I think as the systems get more complicated, if I have like a dexterous hand picking up a coffee mug, oh my god, this picture kind of breaks, right? It's like it would be just these shards of possible contacts and the exact order that I go through them or whatever. Uh, it gets really really bad. So people don't do this for like dexterous hands interacting with super rich contact. Okay, but for legs with point, you know, all of our, have you noticed all of our quadrupeds have like spherical feet, right? This stuff works really well in those regimes. Okay, so let's play with this a little bit. I tried to think of some fun examples. Um, I thought, okay, so, so I wanted to somehow tell you that um, a system that had a couple different solutions, right, interesting solutions. So let's say I'm gonna pass to Xiao, right? Uh, I could throw through the air, I could do a bounce pass. If I was doing, being fancy, I could try to make it bounce twice, right? You can imagine how to write each of those, right? If I were to define the two bounce pass, I would write three direct collocation. I, could, I can actually add this direct collocation three times to the same mathematical program, okay? And then just say the final uh, version of this is gonna be the initial version of that. You have to get the elastic for a bouncing ball. You get the e elastic conditions correct, okay? But by parameterizing it this way, saying that at the end of the first cycle, I'm gonna be in contact with the ground, you know, and then just have the ballistic trajectory, boom, boom. You can do things like different bounce passes. So I wrote the simple dynamics of a, of a bounce pass, just to show you, and I just decided to plot all of them, okay? So you can just choose, I, I, I said, you know, I, number of bounces, and I chose whether I wanted to throw it up or throw it down, because there's, even if I were to throw it to Xiao, at two bounces, I could go like this, or I could kind of go down, right? And by just sort of going through it, you can, um, you know, trajectory optimization will solve that pretty easily, right? You can find yourself local minima in, even in this kind of a simple problem. But the difference in each of those curves is the number of Dirk-Hall programs I put in, basically, and the events that I specifically encoded. Is that clear? Uh, okay, so the question was about local minima. So um, 
we actually, that's such an important question, especially as people are doing projects that if you're doing trajectory optimization, I think debugging a trajectory optimization, like which could be breaking in terms of local minima or in terms of infeasible constraints or other things. Uh, and sometimes the local minima says your problem is infeasible, but actually there's, it's a, there's a feasible solution for nonlinear optimization. That yes, we have like a toolkit of ways that you should debug these things. Um, there's actually a uh, debugging mathematical program uh, tutorial and the Drake tutorial is just to sort of help people know how to plot the infeasible constraints and, and all these other things. And probably there's more tricks that we should write down. Uh, rendering the trajectory as it's solving is a really important one. So you can sort of see it getting stuck as it's trying. Okay, so that's fun, but I, I, I went online. I'm like, there's gotta be a better trick shot somewhere out there. So I found this guy at NC State that did this thing. Okay, can you see that? And he's really happy. That's three in a row. Three in a row, right? All right, so you see this, ready? He throws it against the wall, bounces there, and then back, right? <laughs> Pretty fancy. He worked really hard for that. I wrote it in like two seconds. <laughs> but the hardest part was getting the angular momentum conservation, you know, get the, getting the elastic collision through the angular, you know, through the rotation of the ball. But the trajectory optimization just worked. Okay? So here's my trajectory optimization solution. I can just solve that sort of trick shot, boom, and uh, it's just a handful of costs and constraints. Um, and you can find this solution that sort of bounces off. Oops, let's make that smaller. It starts up here, bounces off the wall. It actually gets a lot of spin when it's, it's going around. It has to because it has to actually turn around when it gets here and go back into the hoop. Right? I mean, he had more flair, but uh, but it's kind of cool that you can take anything like that. You could you can find and, and write a simple trajectory optimization and get it. It's actually useful to, um, to know how to write the collision dynamics through these things. That that's becomes one of the, like, the multi-body plant will just write the continuous dynamics for you. Um, but the Dynamics of collision are more um, bespoke. You know, it depends what's colliding with what and how you define the collision and stuff like this. And we probably could write a general form of it, but I tend to just crunch through the, the math and write, a, write them myself for each case. Okay, so um, in the appendix of the notes is the, is the general form, but um, there is a general form that works with the multi-body equations. And you say, you know, I, you define the guards the conditions that must be true, for instance, the foot must be on the ground, okay, and you define your multi-body dynamics, and turning on and off that is enough to, to solve for the impulsive force that must be true, that must be at work in order to bring something that is about to violate this to rest. It's just, um, it can have multiple solutions, but there's a, a closed form sort of solution to that using a pseudo-inverse that will um, pick, pick one of the solutions that will come bring your robot to the rest. So for like the need compass gate, you know, I have the knee strike and figuring out the, the result of that knee strike on the, like the back stance leg, that's really hard to think about, uh, but it comes right out of the general equations. And even the, the, I used, I had enough fun thinking about the spinning ball for the trick shot that I used that as a simple example of showing how the math goes through uh, for, that, for that case. Questions at that level? Okay, so it turns out it goes pretty far, right? So this is little dog, which was our, you know, this Boston Dynamics had big dog. We had a program working with Boston Dynamics, so they made us little dog. Um, but it, it's pretty good, okay? And uh, the model, the notebook's right in, in the course repo. And with a small change on the basic recipe here, 
you can think about each possible gate as a different trajectory, as a different mode sequence. I'll show you that in, so in, a, in the notebook in just a second here. And you can put costs and constraints such that the dynamics have to be satisfied and that uh, you know, the, the, gate is the, the constraints about which feet are on the ground have to be satisfied. And you can put that together and it just, you, know, you can solve pretty good trajectory optimization problems. I reconstructed, that was an older project. I reconstructed it into the notes you know, using all the new tools. And um, I'll show you how it works here. So first I just made sure little dog wouldn't fall down when, I, when it's standing. Okay, so that's success. It falls down or fell into a stable configuration. And then the gate optimization, you know, walking, trot, rotary gallop, all the famous gates, the definition of the gate is actually just the mode sequence. The, this, these pictures, these gate um, diagrams just have a black area when that foot is on the ground. The left hind foot, the left forefoot, you know, when that's on the ground, that's black. And so the ordering of when each foot comes on, on or off the ground is what defines a gate. Right? And there's some funny gates get animals to do, but I picked those, okay. And then I wrote a little gate optimization. It's a big gate optimization, I guess. Um, and it just has, you know, all the different options, which say which feet have to be in contact when. And you put it down, you put it together, and I just ran the walking one, Let's see what it does. go. It's a little you know, sachet there, but uh, so what I didn't do is like, so the first time we did it, I sort of did the tuning to make it beautiful and good. And, and this, uh, when I did it again, I just didn't do that. So, um, and I, I think the solvers actually, I think snot is worse than it used to be, unfortunately, for our problems. I'm sure it's better for, um, for other people's problems. But uh, so that's a little limp, limpy there, but um, <clears throat> But it kind of, it, it works, you know, this, I think with a little bit of tuning, you can get it to work beautifully and you can get all those gates out. They're all implemented, but some of them are a little janky, like it drag, drags the speed and I should just spend a little bit more time dialing it in. Again, you'll find, um, you'll find that I always try to write these constraints using the joint names and not the you know, element 32 in the vector and stuff like that, that would be killer for a little dog. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, for, for some of the gates, I did put self-collision constraints uh, between the legs. Yeah, so um, I can't remember if I did it for the walk, and we can check if you like. Um, yeah, some of them, no, I think it's, it was the bounding that would really try to pull the front legs back towards, and you had to actually sort of spread your back legs in order to bound successfully. Um, but I avoid, that's an expensive, con that's the same collision avoidance constraint we used, like the min distance constraint we used before. It's just adding that and it, it works, it, but it's an expensive nonlinear constraint to add. Uh, what is your objective function for the Yeah, so um, typically I would just minimize, let's, let's, let's check. I think it's, it's uh, basically effort. Whenever possible, I try to use simple, um, sorry, scroll, scroll, scroll. There's a couple details I'll tell you about. That wasn't the one I was, quadratic error cost. Yeah, I basically want the legs to be kind of in their co comfortable position and the velocities to be low. And otherwise, that's it. I think the rest was constraints. Yeah, try to, I always try to keep the costs clean. I, I think it's hurt me professionally. Like other people made better videos when my algorithms were pretty good, but I, I, think, I, I think I'm happier as a person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's the timing, it's adding costs and constraints. I tried not to, to, to tweak the, the objective function, 
So it would be the, um, it would typically be, um, what would I tune here? So oftentimes it would be the initial guess, right? But I try to keep the optimization clean and, and, um, and not mess with, certainly not mess with the objective. Okay, there's a couple things that I, that I want to dig into on that example because it's, it's a useful example. Um, <coughs> first of all, you'll see um, the full nonlinear trajectory optimization problem for little dog would be a pretty complicated object. You have lot, many links, all, they all have inertias. You're all, you know, just doing that math every time is a lot of computation and uh, it even just adds a, just a lot of complexity into the, into the optimization landscape, okay? But it turns out you can solve an equivalent optimization problem by observing that the effect that the legs have on their interaction with the ground is completely described by the trajectory of the center of mass and the angular momentum of the, around the center of mass, okay? So I can actually write the dynamics only in terms of the center of mass and the ground reaction forces on the, uh, that are coming from the, the ground and uh, we'll talk more about this when we get to humanoids, but you'll see, if you look at this carefully at this optimization, you'll see a lot of, of the dynamics are just about center of mass and angular momentum, and that's enough. That's not an approximation, that's actually enough. You can completely summarize the, the dynamics of the robot with the ground by just thinking about, um, you know, whatever my legs and everything are doing, the ground reaction forces have to match with the center of mass trajectory. The only thing that you lose by writing your dynamics fully in the center of mass is the ability to add like torque limit constraints. If you're not thinking explicitly about the dynamics of the joints, okay, but if, you, if you're willing to say I don't have torque limits on those joints, then you can write things m much simpler and they tend to be numerically much better. I think the, um, the Boston Dynamics folks doing Atlas parkour and stuff have, have suggested in their talks that they do that, right? And that you'll see like a, um, I think they've animated as a big M&M &M guy jumping around, right? That's their center of mass model, okay? But those are, those are not, uh, they don't have to be approximations. They can be exact. But the, inter the, the, the thing that I think we can look a little bit more carefully at, even just using the rimless wheel that's important, is um, there's another, uh, you know, the picture I've given you so far with the rimless wheel, for instance, used this notion of minimal coordinates and Little Dog doesn't use minimal coordinates. It uses floating base coordinates. So let me try to tell you what I mean by that as the, as the next piece here. So when I made my rimless wheel here, I said that the state of that system was completely described by theta and beta dot, which I did because I added a constraint that this foot was on the ground with a pin joint. So that took all of the potential degrees of freedom of my robot and solved them away by putting a constraint here. And not only that, I, I kind of solved for the constraint, so I wrote everything just in terms of theta and theta dot. So I made this a one degree of freedom system. But if you think about how you would do that for little dog, right, if I had to do that for all of the possible configurations of little dog, right, then adding a pin joint here, adding, adding multiple pin joints, I have like a different set of constraints, that gets very hard very fast, okay? So instead, for little dog, we use this floating base coordinates. By the way, um, you can't, if you've taken a, a class on where that has walking robots, you have to know uh, something about quadrupeds, right? So everybody says that the back legs, uh, you know, that the, the legs are backwards, right? Even for a, for a, um, for a, you see like a bird walking, a biped that, has its, that looks like it has its legs backwards. Do you know what that is? Who knows what that is? It's the, angle of 
the ankle, yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess this one here is the, this is the, the long foot with the ankle here, right? And there's actually a, a little knee up in the, right? So whenever you see like a bird that seems to be walking backwards forever, it's actually walking on its toes and its, its ankle is up high and its knee is hidden under its feathers, okay? So we took the knee away and the little dog just walks like that, right? Okay, so, um, so what, if I wanted to do a more general thing and I didn't want to have to solve for the exact minimal dynamics every time for, for the rimless wheel, then what would I do? I could have the rimless wheel floating in space, okay? And now, what are my parameters? <clears throat> in the plane, I could say that maybe it's just the x, y location, I'll say z, I like z better, x, z location of the center of mass, okay, and then maybe some absolute angle relative to And then I have the kinematics that given that state, if you tell me I could write a function, let's say what's the location of foot I given Q, right? This would be my kinematics. And in this higher dimensional system, I can start writing the assumptions that we already made as constraints on that higher dimensional state, right? So um, if I were to say, for instance, that foot one of Q is on the ramp, you know, or it, it could even be at a constant location, right? That would imply also that the derivative of the, you know, foot one the, you know, the time derivative of this okay and I can write those as additional constraints on the original variables and that that's enough to get the kinematics right but to, to get the dynamics right we're also going to reason about forces so I'll put a force Force I, you know, let's say force one, force two. So I actually have decision variables in this optimization for possible forces between every foot and the ground. Okay. And then my dynamic constraints are the multibody equations more generally. I can actually just say that I have some additional forces that come in directly um, and, and affect the dynamics of these variables. Okay, it happens that the way that the, the general form for the way forces enter the manipulator equations comes in, they come in nicely, they come in linearly through a Jacobian of this location of the foot. So J is actually the Jacobian, it's D, um, Q of foot I Q. Okay, so in some sense, I'm going to over parameterize the dynamics by letting the thing float, okay, putting contact forces as possible decision variables, and then adding additional constraints um, to somehow describe my optimization. In the little dog optimization, the constraints for the dynamics are even summarized to say that the center of mass has to evolve according to the, the sum of the forces, you know, equals the acceleration of the center of mass, and similarly angular momentum, okay? But it's written at this higher level. 
And that's called the floating base coordinates for the robot. In the rimless wheel, since it's only one link, it's also the maximal coordinates of the, of the floating base. The minimal coordinates would say I take any constraint I have and I try to solve it away and have a reduced coordinate system that exactly imposes that constraint. Okay. The maximal coordinates says that every link in my robot has a separate floating base and I'm even going to hold the joints together with constraints. The floating base coordinates says I'm going to let the center of mass of my robot be a floating base, okay? I'll still use my normal mechanics for the joints, but the interaction with the, gr with the other objects in the scene, or the ground in this case, will be done through uh, turning on and off costs and constraints and, and forces. Okay? It was, so um, some simulators actually used maximal coordinates. When we had our, um, the competition for, uh, that was first in simulation for the DARPA Robotics Challenge for Atlas. You know, we had our simulator running in Gazebo, for instance. Most of the default solvers in Gazebo use maximal coordinates. So we were pretty happy with our walking algorithm, and then we started pushing the limits to see how fast we could make it walk, because it was a competition. We wanted to run you know, fast. And the thing that started failing was the constraints, and, it, and so like the knees would separate, right? The, the robot would start like coming apart, literally coming apart. And if you picked up something that was like unstable, um, in a maximal coordinate simulator, it's hilarious because your robot literally explodes. It'll just go, you know, your Atlas head goes off spinning down the hill somewhere like that, right? Uh, the floating base coordinates, I think, are very general for optimization. They leverage the internal dynamics of, of, that we know and love, but we use contact with additional cost and constraints. Did I say that well enough? I think looking at the little dog notebook, we'll, you'll see all of that um, pulled out. And even for your compass gate on uh, your problem set, you'll see, you'll see this uh, work through. Okay, but that initial picture of the hybrid dynamics, that's the most important picture, yeah. So, so yes, so why don't we use the minimal coordinates? So if we have a predefined gate cycle, you could, um, so certainly in the case where you have only one foot down at a, at a time, and you have a serial kinematic chain still, and you could just put a pin joint there, change your URDF, load it in, that would absolutely work. It gets more complicated when you're in double support, for instance, now you have four bar linkage type constraints, and the way that simulators even tend to solve that is with things that are actually pretty similar to what we're doing in the optimization. So I think the work you have to do for rewiring the kinematic chains just doesn't, doesn't worth it because it doesn't scale to the more complicated things. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me address one more important point here. So far, I've advocated for this hybrid approach to contact, where we think about these, you know, discrete collision events. Right, and then, so the forces might be zero he here, for instance, and then the forces be turned on here if I'm in contact. So I'll turn on and off different costs and cons different uh, constraints on different variables. In, in different modes, and that's one way to define the different modes, okay? But why not go with, why not do trajectory optimization with sort of the, um, you know, the spring models? Why, why don't I put, remember I talked about different models of, of um, let's see, my foot is under the ground a little bit, right? Why don't I put a stiff spring here and then get rid of this sort of discrete aspect of the optimization problem? Because that mode sequence starts to feel very constraining pretty fast. Right, so why not do that? 
And the answer is you can do that. And in fact, I would say more and more often these days, people are doing that, okay? But you have to be careful, I think, when you're doing that. Um, so versus, let's say, stiff spring continuous dynamics. continuous, but they're just changed so fast, right? I think you can do this. So, so I think in fact, that's the trend I would say these days. You'll see people that are trying to do like ILQR, for instance, through contact. Okay, this can be made to work, okay? Oftentimes, you will be happier if you make initial versions at least of your optimization where you make the ground very soft, okay? Um, but just to keep the numerics better. But I will say, I, I used to say that this was just a bad idea, but, but people have really made a lot of progress on making this work, okay? So you'll see, you'll see a lot of algorithms like that. But there's a big thing that happens um, when, you, when you go to this model and you give up the mode sequence. The mode sequence actually has a lot of information in it. So take, for example, my, my basketball pass, right? Um, so I'm passing the ball over to here, and let's say there's no, um, this is my basketball example, okay? And this is my ground. And let's say I'm going, I've got an initial guess for the, for the solution, which I'm passing it to Xiao, let's say, through the air. And let's say now that I move, I don't know, I move Xiao a little bit farther away or something like this, and I get to the point where I can't quite throw it all that way. It would really be a lot better to do a bounce pass. There's no, so, so something characteristically different happens here. It could be continuously different if you go down and somehow touch the ground. But the problem is when you're not touching the ground, there's nothing that your optimization sees that knows it could do better by going down here, right? There's sort of no information that, that flows between this solution and the fact that there's another solution here that bounces this way. This is a lot like the, the, the plane having to fly left or right around the tree, right? You have to get a lot worse before you get better and find this completely different solution, okay? So contact very much adds a lot of the local minima that we're used to. The mode sequence, in addition to making the optimization a little bit better, is a handy way to give a lot of information to the optimization, right? It says, for instance, I want one trajectory, and at the end of that trajectory, it better be in contact with the ground. At the beginning of the next trajectory, it has to be in contact with the ground, right? And so you're actually guiding the optimization, which is, you know, it's not surprising that it would work better, <laughs> right? It's also not surprising that it's annoying to write, okay? But it's a, it's a very convenient way to add a lot of information to the system and, and the result is much better optimization, okay? Yeah, there's a lot to potentially say about that, but I think that's the main, the main point, right? So reinforcement learning, for instance, people are doing RL for quadrupeds these days. That's been starting to work well, right? And they are, they're doing the more continuous, soft, stiff springs, right? And we've actually done work in my group lately to try to understand why that works. Like, so how is it that you can get sort of reasonable gradients through the, through the simulator that would potentially even cause it to learn to make contacts, right? And one of the interesting questions, one of the interesting answers that, that I wouldn't have anticipated until we started studying it more carefully is that the way people add random noise to the simulators actually has the effect of kind of smoothing the contact and it gives you force at a distance, okay? So it actually, because there's randomness in the simulation, if I'm considering, let's say, policies that would sort of be going like this, every once in a while something happens, I've got domain randomization or something, that would, even though I'm, my policy is mostly going like this, it will, with some small probability, start bouncing, 
Okay, and so the randomness that people think about for exploration also has this nice effect of sort of discovering potentially different, um, I mean, I guess that's the exploration story. Okay, but in the contact, we can actually analyze it carefully and understand it as a, as a different contact model, the randomness people are adding. Okay, Mujoko, in the trajectory optimization for Mujoko, Mujoko actually has a relaxation that allows contact at a distance in the trajectory optimization, which is smart. I mean, that's a, that's a good way to help the optimizer out. Um, but the problem is if you don't ever turn the contact at a distance off at the final solution, then you get ridiculous um, trajectories out that would be work on a real robot. I saw a question over there, yeah? I was gonna ask about relaxing, relaxing the contact. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so you, can, you can make these as soft constraints that allow force at a distance and that can help the optimization, right? As long as you turn it off before you run it on the real robot. Cool, okay, that's oh, good. I can I, idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so the question is, you know, can you, can you, see, is that a natural way to sort of seed multiple different possible? You, know, you could even try to enumerate the possible mode sequences or something like that. I would say, maybe the two big trends these days would be um, RL kind of approaches, which are trying to use randomness as brute force exploration and. We can put it on the cloud and put it on GPU and it'll eventually figure something out. And that's powerful, right? And there's other approaches that are trying to more explicitly enumerate the possible sequences and reason efficiently about them. Yeah, and I think both have, have merits. Yeah, but the combinatorial space gets big fast. So you have to be smart about the way you operate in that space. Uh, we definitely have one lecture when we get to the more motion planning where we talk about some of the combinatorial aspects of that. Okay, go outside, go outside enjoy the weather. See you Thursday when it'll be like 87 or something. Right?